Good morning. Children, you could be dismissed for junior church. And for the rest of us, would you turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 3? Revelation chapter 3. There are a lot of hurting and broken uh, people uh, today. Uh, a lot of pain, you know, all the way back to the Garden of uh, Eden. Right there, there was, uh, there was great harmony. There was great peace. Um, there's harmony between humanity and God. They, God walked with humanity. And there was harmony between humanity and nature. You know, a lion and a lamb could lay down together. And there was harmony between humanity and humanity. And all of that changed in Genesis chapter 3. And if you're familiar with the story, Genesis chapter 3, sin came into the world. And all the division and all the discord and all the disharmony and all the brokenness and all the pain and hurt and shame is a byproduct of Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis 3, a new counselor came in, a new person came in who spoke to Adam and Eve and gave them counsel and belief that, um, that there was something other than God that was going to set them free. And it wasn't. And it led them to the shame and the brokenness and the fear and the guilt. And you know, in the shame, what they did was they covered it up. And the fear, what they did was they ran and hid. And the guilt, they tended to blame. And let's be honest, that's, that's all of us today. I mean, all the way back to Garden of Eden is the same struggle that you and I have today. We live in a broken world full of shame, full of fear, full of guilt, and the answer is God. Satan wanted us to move away from God's word. Satan wanted us to move away from the goodness of God, and Satan wanted us to move away from the authority of God in our lives. That was his his plea to us, and we bought it. And sad to say, we tend to buy it day after day. Now you fast forward from the Garden of Eden all the way to the end of the story from Genesis to Revelation. And in the between, there's a lot of misery, and there's a lot of brokenness, and there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of guilt. And humanity went down one of two paths. They went down the path of self-reliance or reliance on gospel grace. Right there in Adam's first children, Cain versus Abel. One went down the path of grace and the other one went down the path of law themselves. And, and we see that throughout the Old, Old Testament. Same thing, man-centeredness or Christ or God-centeredness. So two paths, really, you know, you look and you say, how many religions are in this world? And to be honest, there are really only two. Uh, there's a religion that is focused on humanity, and there's a religion that is focused on grace. One that is about our works, and another that is about God's work for us. We've seen that right from the very beginning. And then Jesus came here as the only remedy for us. The only remedy, because our works were never going to be good enough. Our works are always feeble and fra uh, failing. Even the best of us, and in the best of times, we struggle in life. And that's why we need a person that could live a perfect life, and we need a person that could die a death in our place. We needed someone that was going to take our place and answer the issue where we need forgiveness and we need freedom, which we will celebrate at the Lord's table in a moment. John is the very last of these apostles. Jesus died on a cross, rose victoriously, and then he set these apostles out to spread the good news, the message of hope to the world. Slowly but surely, these apostles have faced persecution. These apostles have faced a lot of pain. Most of them died horrendous deaths. These apostles have been broken externally, but they've been fulfilled in Christ. And John is the last of them. Probably this is written in the 90s, and John is an old man now. Now, John is not going to die by stoning. John is not going to be die by his head chopped off. John is not going to die by being crucified upside down, as some of the other apostles are. John is going to, in all likelihood, die 
in isolation on an island. That was his punishment for gospel grace. And as we look at this story, Jesus began Revelation by telling you about himself. He took the first chapter to say, this is who I am, and this is who you need to see me as, and you need to worship me alone. That's what Jesus did. He began in, John, in Revelation chapter 1 by talking about the fact that it was the Father that sent him, that empowered by the Spirit, and that Jesus Christ, this triune God, came here to do something to rescue you, to forgive you, and to set you free. And then he's been writing these letters to churches. Now, we know that these churches, as, as has been laid out, these churches were real churches in this real time, but elements of those churches, what Christ was teaching those churches, Christ's message to those churches is a message to you and to me, to our time. To look at ourselves in Ephesus, we saw that Jesus said that I hold the seven stars and I walk among the golden lampstands. And they said, he said that they were doctrinally vigilant. They were really good in their doctrine and they endured, maybe through persecution. But he rebuked them because they had lost their first love. And what he, his solution was, remember and repent and turn back to me. He said to the church at Smyrna that the first and the last, the one who died and came to life. That's how he represented himself. And he said they were spiritually rich and they had endured persecution in their church. But in Smyrna, he had actually no rebuke for that church, which would have been really encouraging. You know, could you imagine if he came to the chapel at Warren Valley and there was no rebuke for us? And he says, I want you to be faithful even unto death. To the church of Pergamum, he says, I have a sharp two-edged sword. And he says, you hold fast to my name, you know, in the midst of persecution. In fact, one of them had died for their faith. They had not denied their faith. But his rebuke to them was that they were giving in to false teaching. There was a compromise that was there in their lives. And his solution, repent, turn. As we heard last time, Thyatira... Thyatira, their eyes, uh, his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were burnished bronze. And this, his commendation was that they were growing in love and they were evidenced by deeds of service. But his rebuke was that there was a lack of discernment in their lives and they were tolerating heresy more and more. And his solution was to hold fast and keep Christ's work till the end. Now we come to the fifth church, Sardis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. What we're going to find is that he is going to make no commendation for this church. There was nothing that he was looking at this church and saying, you're doing a really good job. He went right to rebuke. This is chilling, challenging, very honestly. And then what he does is he gives them a solution. He says, I want you to hear this. Keep my word and repent. This is so important. And if not, Christ is going to come as a thief. But at the end, he, he said this, that even in this church that was dying, there was a remnant. There was a small number. There was a few. You know, Jesus said the broad is the path that leads to destruction and many are on it. But then he said, small and narrow is the path that leads to life and many are on it. Well, Jesus is saying here that there is a small remnant in this church I hope we are not this dying church, but hear this word as a challenge this morning for yourself personally and for our church um, corporately. Hear the word of the Lord, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel, the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation, reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your works not, I'm sorry, I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet, 
you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garment, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's holy, sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, and life-changing word. Would you pray with me? So, Father, as we come to this passage, there is not a church and there's not a person here that wants to think of them as self as dead. We want to believe that we're alive, but the reality is, is that sad to say there are many people today that sit in churches today that believe because of a profession in the past or because of some good works that they've done or things that they have served, that they are believers. And your son is saying very clearly, be very careful. So Father, help us to hear these words as words of challenge, words of hope, words of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we uh, look at the passage, same way we've been working through each one of these passages, we are going to hear Christ speaking through the Apostle John to a specific church. We're going to hear about the church, the city, and Christ in the first section. Then we're going to hear the confrontation that Jesus is going to give. Then we're going to hear the choice that they have to make, and then Christ is going to end with some level of comfort and compassion. Let's start with the church itself. He simply says that this is the church in Sardis. And so it's the angel to the church in Sardis. And as we, as you remember right from chapter 1, we had talked about the fact that this could be a literal angel. Every other time in the book of Revelation, it is an angel that is talked about. Uh, some commentators wonder if this is the pastor of the church, the leader of the church. Whichever way it is, this person is called to be a messenger. An angel is called to be a messenger. A pastor is called to be a messenger. So this is the church at Sardis. The city, let me tell you a little bit about the city. The city is, was once a truly great city. It was about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, and it was about 50 miles due east of Smyrna. And it was located in the mountain regions, and it was a very fertile valley ground. And there were five major roads that went into this city, and it was a trade center. This was a capital of the old kingdom, Lydia. And King Croesus um, reigned with great wealth and splendor at the time. But the city was conquered. And the city was conquered on two occasions, but once by the Persian king Cyrus. And so what the city had done at points in times is that they lived on their laurels, they lived on their past, and they lived on their, the prior things that they had done, and that's where they found their rest. They spent most of their time thinking, looking back at what they had done rather than looking at what they were doing presently and where they needed to go future. That's real important for us to keep in mind. So the church of Sardis, the city itself, and let's talk about Christ. Now Christ has given himself an identification of himself to each one of these letters. And this identification goes back to chapter 1. And he calls himself the word of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 1, we see in Revelation chapter 1 that it seems to be talking about the Holy Spirit that is here. The seven spirits of God. In fact, let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, and let's look at uh, verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it said, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, so these seven churches that we're talking about, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Most people tend to believe that that is the Father. That is truly God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then the seven spirits who are before the throne and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So now if this is a Trinitarian blessing, we would see the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. It's interesting that he also says grace to you and peace. You know, any time in the New Testament when grace and peace are put together, grace always comes first, peace always comes second. you have any idea why? 
you can't have real peace without grace given to God, from God. That God gives us grace, he fills us with grace, and then we have peace with him. You can't have peace in relationship unless you have grace. So grace leads to peace in life. So John is saying here that we have the Father, we have the Spirit, the seven spirits. And why seven spirits? There's only one Holy Spirit. Seven in the Bible is a word of completion, fullness. So most commentators will believe that when he's talking here about the seven spirits of God, uh, the Holy Spirit, what he's talking about is the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the completeness of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So let's go back to chapter 3. So he says, grace to you and peace from who is and was and is to come. And now he's back here in chapter 3, verse 1. He says that I am the one who has the seven spirits of God. Now, Jesus, if you remember, on the night he was betrayed, he said to his disciples, I, I need to leave, and then I am sending to you a paraclete. I am sending to you a counselor. I am sending one to you. So Jesus leaves, and then he gives us the blessing of the Holy Spirit, who will lead us in all truth. So Jesus is, in essence, saying that I give you the Holy Spirit. I hold the Spirit in your life, in your hands, but then Jesus not only says the seven spirits, but then he says the seven stars, which we already from chapter one, we saw that the, well, those were the seven churches. So he's got these, this angel, this messenger, maybe a literal angel or the pastor. The seven spirits is the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and the seven stars are to these churches. So what is Jesus picturing here? Jesus is picturing himself as sovereign. He's picturing himself as your absolute authority. He is picturing himself as the one that gives you the Holy Spirit, and he is the one that is over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in essence, what he is saying is this. Anytime there is any revival in a church, any reformation of life, any lasting change in a person's life, any renewal is coming through me. I should get an amen. <laughs> Any renewal, any restoration, any revival comes through Christ alone. That when we find ourselves focusing on our own abilities, our own knowledge, our own power and our strength, as, as was said through Jeremiah, let not the person boast in their wisdom or the power or their strength, but boast in the Lord. Jesus is saying that you should be boasting in me, but they struggled. And here's the confrontation. He, he, no commendation. He jumps right into the confrontation. So he told us about the church, the city. He told us about him, Christ. Now he goes to the confrontation. Chapter 3, verse 1, the second part of it. He says this, I know your works. Oh, that's, um, that's actually, that could be actually a little scary if you start to think about it. It's like, you know, Jesus knows, right? Jesus knows everything about you. Jesus knows every thought that you've ever had. Jesus knows every word that you've ever spoken. Jesus knows everything that you've done in private. All those things that people can't see, Jesus sees. He says, I know you. I know your works. Wow. And then he says this, you have a reputation for being alive. Wouldn't we want a reputation for being alive? Wouldn't we want our church, if, if Warren County, Washington and Warren County knew that chapel is alive, right? They had a reputation for being alive. But you are what? You're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For have, I have not found your works complete in my sight. What a tremendous rebuke by the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, it feels like, it seems like from the world's viewpoint, you're alive. Maybe even from your own viewpoint, you're alive, but you are dead. What does he mean by dead? You know, in the scriptures, when it talks about dead, there is a physical death of a body. And I think he's using this parallel that the church is supposed to be a body and our body is breaking down and it's dying. 
But also there's a spiritual component. Back in Ephesians chapter three, uh, 2, he said this. He said, you were once dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you once all lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of your body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Ooh, what a word. He's saying, you say that you're alive, but you are showing yourself to be dead. And then Jesus says, wake up, strengthen what remains, and it's about to die. And he says, I have not found your works complete in my sight. We'll come back to that phrase. So reputation means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, your name and what people say about you is um, oftentimes valued, and, it's, and at times it's important. Sometimes people will say really nice things about you, and sometimes people will say really bad things about you. The question is, what is true about you? And so what he, he said here is this, that you have a reputation, but there's a reality. There are some things that people say about you, but there's a reality of what is really true. And Jesus is now going to give you a reality check, or the church a reality check. I have found your works, and they are not complete. I believe that what he's talking about here is the fact they have not been preaching the full counsel of God's word. They have not been preaching the word totally. They've been preaching enough of it that people will be happy and say, oh, that sounds good, but they were not preaching the fullness that will offend people and cause them to either repent or turn away. And so what they were doing is they were doing some nice works. Maybe they were doing some nice things in the city. Maybe they were doing some nice things for other people. But in the final analysis, were they preaching that it was Christ and his cross alone? Apparently not. So now Jesus comes to them and he says that I have this against you. You are not following my way. Now Jesus immediately goes to a command in verse, um, verse 2. And he says, I want you to follow these five-step commands, because this is important for us to hear. Hear these five exhortations to this dying church, but also to us. These five ex exhortations are so important. Here are the five. Wake up, number one. He says, I want you to wake up. Now, history is interesting. Now, Jesus is, is I believe, playing off their history. So I told you that on two occasions, the city had been invaded and they had been overrun. On both of those occasions, so let me tell you about the city. The city seemed to be impregnable. It was up on a high mountain. And there was only one narrow path to get up there. But if you could defend that path, you could have almost an impregnable city. They stood up on a mountain. They didn't think anybody could get to them. They were high and above. But on two occasions, the person that was supposed to be protecting their six fell asleep. And invading armies came in and took over the city. So that had happened in their history on two occasions. Now what Jesus is saying, wake up. He's using their, their past to say, I want you to be very mindful of your present. That it's not about a physical army that's coming in. It's about a spiritual issue that you have in your life. You, th you think you're impregnable. But there is a back door here. And if you're not very careful, your enemy can come and destroy you. Wake up. Yeah, you know, that's a really that's a good counsel for us. You know, that uh, a dead church, he's sw switching these mel metaphors. He goes from a dead church to an alive church that is sleeping. I was thinking about this song by Keith Green. You know, Keith Green, old guy, right? He's, he passed away, I believe, in 1983 in a plane crash with his um, children. I could still remember the day when Keith Green died. Um, and uh, I cried very honestly because I really liked his music. Can I just read some lyrics to you before we get back? He says, do you see, do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care? Don't you care? Are you going to let them down? How can you be so numb? 
not to care if they come. You close your eyes and pretend your job's done. Oh, bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. You know, it's all I ever hear. No one aches. No one hurts. No one even sheds one tear. But he cries. He weeps. He bleeds. And he cares for your needs. And you just lay back, soaking it in. Oh, can't you see such a sin? Cause his people to the door. And you turn them away. And you smile. God bless you. Be at peace. And all heaven just weeps. Because Jesus came to your door and you left him out on the streets. You know, there is a, a church that will say the right things to people to make them feel good. And maybe their congregations will have hundreds of thousands of people. People will love them. The world will love them. But they're not telling them the truth. And Jesus says, be very careful that you're not sleeping in the light. Wake up. Second, strengthen what remains. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but what he's saying is that there is a remnant that is here, and there is still gospel that you've had in the past. Now you need to strengthen it. Faith is this wonderful thing. In Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus, um, Paul had said, you know, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That, that Jesus gives faith to you through his Holy Spirit. But what you're called to do is to strengthen that faith, to exercise that faith, to build it up. Like you build up your body, you're called to build up your faith. He says, strengthen what remains. Get rid of the divided loyalties. Get rid of the incomplete obedience. I want your obedience. Strengthen what remains. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. And the third thing he says is remember. And he says, remember two things. I want you to remember what you've received, and I want you to remember what you've heard. So what have you received? You received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've received salvation by, by my Holy Spirit, that you were brought to faith. I want you to remember what you've received as we do it this morning. But I want you to remember what you've heard. What have you heard? You've heard the gospel message over and over again, the gospel message that has forgiven you and set you free. Let the gospel so saturate your minds. Remember, back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Verses 11 through 20, it says this, Take care lest you forget what the Lord your God said by keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have is multiplied, that your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the household of slavery, when who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with a fiery serpents and sor uh, scorpions, thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of a flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your father did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hands have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, who has given you the power to get the wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as to this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after the gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly tell you today that you shall perish like the nations that the Lord shall make perish before you. You shall perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord. You see, this wasn't just a Sardis problem, and this is not just a uh, problem with the, uh, um, the Israelites in the desert. It is a problem for us. When the things in our lives go generally well, we have a tendency to forget God. Be mindful of that. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember, and then keep it, he says. It means, by the Holy Spirit, keep obeying God gospel truth. Live free. See, what Christ did for you and for me at the cross was he didn't simply offer us forgiveness of our sins. What he did was he set you free. You don't have to go back to it. 
we should be different if we look exactly like the world if we talk like the world if we think like the world if we act like the world then there is a room to believe that maybe christ has not really changed our hearts and our lives jesus says keep it and finally he says repent Repent, metanoia in the Greek, it means to change your mind. It means that you are going a different direction. You are confessing, I agree with you, God, and then there's a change of mind. There is a change of desires, and then there's a change of will and actions. And in Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, He who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses it and forsakes it finds mercy. So Jesus said to this church that is faltering, he says, I want you to wake up. I want you to strengthen what remains. I want you to remember gospel grace. I want you to remember the cross. I want you to live out the cross by keeping it in your life. And I want you to repent. I think we need to hear that word today. So Jesus has spoken to the church, the city, and about himself, he is given some con con condemnation. He has given them five commands, and now he ends with a promise. In verses four through six. I love this. He says, yet. I love words like that, yet, right? Against the dark backdrop of life, there's a yet. Go, go uh, if, you, if you're back in Ephesians 2, after that, you know, incredible judgment, you know, dead, trespasses, walking the course of the world, sons of disobedience, passion of the flesh, desires of the body, children of wrath. But then verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even while we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages, he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this, not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one will be able to boast. For we are his workmanship. He's, he's crafting something new, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared before him that we should walk in them. So, so Jesus said, yeah, it's hallelujah. Jesus said here in Revelation chapter 4 and 3, he said, yet you still have a few that remain people who have not soiled their garments. They walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You know, this great contrast that, um, that John has been laying out, or Jesus has been laying out through John, he, he talked about the church itself, and then he talked about individuals in the church. So maybe this will help. He, he started by talking about their name, their reputation, now, the church itself had a reputation of being good, their status, their standing, but they were dead. The individuals, in reality, were really alive, but very few. Many were dead, few were alive. He talked about their works. The works of the church itself were incomplete, not following through, but then the works of the believers were they had not soiled their garments, they walked with Christ, and they are, in essence, worthy. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then the promise that Jesus gives to the church itself that is walking away, he says, I, the Lord Jesus, will come like a thief, and you will not know it. What hour I will come, I will come against you, just like they invaded your city years ago. I will come invade you. But Jesus' promise to the believers, he said this, you'll be clothed in white garments. I'll never blot your name out of the book. I will confess your name before my father and before the angels. What a glorious thing that Jesus is going to confess your name. You're going to be vindicated. And the response of the world is interesting. The response of the world for the church itself was they had a good reputation in the world. Maybe a lot of people liked them. Maybe a lot of people were attending. They were experiencing remarkable growth in this church. That's why they looked like they were alive. Maybe their building was amazing. 
They appeared to be alive, but they were dead. And the reality of the very few was the world probably didn't have a great idea about them. And they were very few, not big. And they were suffering persecution, not like the church. Yet they were truly alive. So Jesus' promise to them is this. Jesus says that the one who, clo- who conquers will be clothed in white. I really like that. What is Jesus saying there? White in the scriptures talks about this idea of holiness, impurity, fidelity. He's saying that you'll have a white garment. And then he says, I will never blot your name out of the book of life. It doesn't matter what the world says. You can have the assurance that I give you the perseverance. I give you eternal security. I save you and I keep you. What glory, man. It's like I I stand in your righteousness, Christ, not mine. I am a sinner, but you are my great savior. I'm a great sinner, but you are a great savior. And, And I stand in your glory and your holiness and your purity. But I also have the assurance that my salvation is not based on my incomplete performance. My salvation is based on your perfect performance, Christ. Jesus, you saved me and you keep me, you glorify me, you assure me, but then you vindicate me. Wow, look at this. I will confess your name before my Father. Many of you sit here today and you feel great condemnation. You believe that God is condemning you, but if you're in Christ, there is therefore now what? No condemnation. Jesus said in Matthew 10, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Or John said this in his epistle, my little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if any one of you sins, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation, the appeasement for your sins and not for your sins also, but for the sins of those in the whole world. All of those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are these people worthy because of their own ability? No, they have an alien righteousness that has been given to them. Christ has taken his perfect righteous robe and placed it on you. So today I I want you to hear the word to Sardis. I want you to hear that there was a church that thought they had it right and they didn't. I want you to hear not just the church itself, but I want you to think about this individually. Are you representing Christ in how you live? Not perfectly. None of us are. We we foul foul up every day. I know I do. The question is, do you go back from your sin to the Savior, from your guilt to grace? And are you representing gospel grace out of your life? Is there something that's changed in you? I want you to remind yourself of this as we come to the communion table, that God is a holy God, and we are not. And every one of us will answer to God for how we've lived our lives. There was that commercial, I have fallen and I can't get up. That's true, spiritually. I have fallen. And I can't get up on my own. There's nothing I can do to reach God. There's nothing I can do to achieve Christ's righteous standards. Nothing in my hands I bring. There's no good thing in me. Even the good things that I do are tainted with sin. And without divine intervention, I cannot be saved. Without God's help, without his gracious work, I can't be forgiven and I can't be free. We're doomed except but God. But God, with his divine righteousness, with God, with his loving call, calls you to repent and turn. Turn to his grace and mercy, not your works. You can repent and come to Christ because Christ has provided that path for you. One pastor said it this way, the bad news is this, we're separated from God, which is true. The worst news is this, there's nothing we could do about it. 
Ooh. The good news is this. Jesus Christ came here to save you. The best news is this. If you run to the cross, you are forever free. Run to the cross today. Would you pray with me? Father, there are many churches today that will have huge sanctuaries that are filled. Some of them are really preaching gospel truth. They're preaching about Christ. They're not preaching about themselves. They are preaching about his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. And we pray that those churches we continue to grow. But the sad reality is there are a lot of churches that are big, that are dead. There are small churches today, Father, that are in church services that are pretty small, and they're preaching gospel. And the numbers are small because few are those that are there. And I have to also admit that there are small churches out there that are dying, and then nobody's going because they have nothing to offer. Father, the size of the church doesn't matter. It's the health of the church and where they find their, find their foundation. So help us to come to the altar. Help us to come to Christ's cross. Help us to come to the risen Savior. Help us to come to the one that holds the seven spirits, the fullness of the spirit, and holds this church in his hands. And Father, if we haven't done that, help us to repent and return very quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So it is a, a good opportunity to be able to come to the communion table this morning. And the communion table offers us the opportunity to remember what Christ has done for us. It's not about human achievements, it's about Christ's work in our lives. Sardis probably was focusing on their past glory or past human achievement, and we need to focus on Christ and his cross every day of our life. Not just for your salvation, but every moment of your life needs to be Christ-centered, cross-centered, and that should spill out of your life with new freedom and forgiveness in life. As we come to this table, I want you to think of this table not just a cup or a piece of cracker. I want you to think of a cross. Now, Christ is not being re-crucified here. Some places believe that he's being re-crucified here. Jesus Christ died once for sins, once for all. But when we come to this communion table, what we do is we remember. A ring on a finger reminds me of a marriage ceremony 30 years ago. A communion cup reminds me of what Christ did for me 2,000 years ago. So when you take the cup this morning... And when you take the bread, remember what Christ has done for you. Uh, the leaders are going to come and hand out the cup. And if you're new to our church, um, we welcome you to take. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're part of his family, you're part of the family. So take the cup. And if you're not, what I want you to do is let the cup pass by. Let the bread pass by. But then find one of us leaders so that we can talk to you to tell you about how you could be really alive in Christ. Would you pray with me before the leaders come down? So Lord, bless us and remind us of the kind grace that your son has given us. Help us to honor him. Help us to bow down before him. Help us to worship him for he alone is worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.